All right, well, thank you to uh, the organizers, you guys, for um, the invitation to speak. And uh, I do see some people in the audience that I know, so hi. Uh, also to the people I don't know. Um, so I'm gonna do something I've never done before, which is give a slide talk on my iPad with this uh, stylus so that I can circle stuff. Um, probably not as pointless stuff as doing that, but I'll try to keep it relevant. Um, so throughout this talk, um, X is going to be a projective variety. Sometimes I'll, I'll use quasi-projective, but that's okay. For the purposes of it, we can always assume X is projective and F is going to be a dominant rational self map. So I just mean that it will have dense image. And given that it's a dominant self map, we get a dominant, uh, a dynamical system um, with the variety X and the map F. Um, where we can take a point in X and we can just repeatedly iterate F. Um, and as long as we stay away from the indeterminacy locus, we're fine. Um, and so what one wants to do is one wants to understand how this, uh, the behavior of this dynamical system. And one of the more important, uh, most important um, invariants for these sorts of self maps are the dynamical degrees, and in particular, the first dynamical degree, which we'll denote by uh, lambda f. So what's the definition? I'll give a more intuitive definition, but I'll give the precise definition here. Um, we take an ample divisor h of our variety x, and this uh, notation isn't so good that I've done, but f to the n is the nth uh, iterate the, uh, under composition of f, and then what we do is we take the pullback along h. Uh, and then we take the dot with h to the dim x minus one. So perhaps the easiest case to think of is with you when you take a surface and what basically you're just pulling along, pulling uh, an ample, pull back of an ample divisor and then taking an intersection with another uh, ample divisor and just counting the number of points, uh, a generic one. Um, so uh, the thing is that if we take this limit, it actually does exist and it doesn't depend on what ample divisor you choose. And the other important fact is that it's, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't change under birational conjugacy. So I've written it here that if we conjugate with a birational uh, map from x to x prime, then we get a new uh, um, self map on a variety x prime, and it doesn't change the dynamical degree of the map. Okay, so I'll give some examples and, and try to make it more intuitive. Um, so what we want to say is that these dynamical degrees, and I've only given the first one, sort of gives you a, a very coarse understanding of the dynamical system. And I'll try to say a little bit more about that. And I do say that in general, one has higher dynamical degrees, one in each uh, cohomology class. Um, no, one for each, um, for each I. Um, and uh, they were introduced by Friedland, and uh, they were originally introduced, uh, used a, a limb soup rather than a limit, but they have this submultiplicative property that implies that you, they exist with a limit. Um, okay, uh, I just wanna just, okay, that's good. Um, so the dynamical degree is mostly studied in complex dynamics, but I wanna say that recently in arithmetic dynamics, it's gotten a lot of attention due to this work of Kawaguchi and Silverman. And what the idea is here now, if you have a, a global field and you take some point, uh, some K point in a uh, global field K, you take some K point in your variety and you iterate, uh, you can try to understand the orbit by understanding the heights of the points in the orbit and how they grow, uh, the asymptotics. And Kawaguchi and Silverman show um, that it's related in a strong way to the dynamical degree. It's, it gives an upper bound in terms of, you can uh, get an upper bound for the heights, for how the heights grow in terms of this dynamical degree. Uh, and there's a question of when equality holds and it's suspected that equality should hold in most general cases, as long as the orbit of the starting point is risky dense. So that's the Kawaguchi Silverman conjecture. And it's gotten a lot of attention in the last uh, few years. Uh, and it's a very interesting uh, conjecture relating heights and this dynamical degree. Okay, um, so one thing we pointed out was that this um, sequence um, is submultiplicative, and I'll try to explain why that's the case. So the limit always exists, so that's why we have this limit. 
And I'd like to just do a more intuitive way of viewing the dynamical degree just so you can see it. So I'm going to look at the, the special case when x is projective d space. And here it's much more intuitively clear. So if here we have a rational self map from projective d space to itself, then on a dense open set, we can give it by this d plus one tuple of polynomials. And uh, of course, we want to assume they have no common factors. So we have polynomials p0 through pd. They're homogeneous of the same degree m, and they have no common factors. Otherwise, we would just cancel those out. And that m is going to be the degree of our f. And so what we can do is now we can just iterate this repeatedly, and we can compute the degree of f to the n and take this uh, 1 over n. So now we can see why we should expect submultiplicativity. If f to the m is given by this d plus 1 uh, projective uh, tuple of uh, polynomials, and f to the n is given by the, the, these coordinates, then if I look at f to the m plus n, I'm just composing these two. Uh, it doesn't matter which way I do it. I've chosen it to do it this way. Um, then we get p0, and we plug in q0 through qd, and so on and so forth. So if f to the m has degree a and f to the n has degree b, then these polynomials are all going to have degree a times b. And so what we get is that the degree of f to the n plus m is less than or equal to the product of the degrees. And I've put a less than or equal to uh, because there could be some cancellation, right? So it's not inequality in general, although, um, you know, we usually expect it to be an equality if we, if we did something like took something in a, a, a generic element in the um, moduli space of degree A maps or something like this. Um, so let me look at an example, uh, a straightforward example, where we can compute uh, the dynamical degree. And I've started off with the simplest example. Uh, F is just going to be the map that takes uh, x uh, colon y to x squared colon y squared. And this is a degree 2 map. And if I iterate this n times, I get a map of degree 2 to the n. And so I can see that the dynamical degree is just 2 in this case. So uh, not so hard to compute in this case, although in, in general there can be cancellation. Um, so we don't get this equality in general because, oh, that's ugly. Let me get rid of that. Because there can be cancellation. Um, and so I've given the easy example, which I saw from Jeff Diller, um, which he used to motivate the cancellation. This is a, I, I don't know what this map is called. I call it, I call it the Nutter map. I, maybe it's got another name. Um, but basically, the group of birational automorphisms of P2 is called the Cremona group, and it's generated by PGL2 uh, C and this map uh, F. And it's almost a, the free, prod, a, a free product of those two uh, groups. This is going to be a cyclic group, but it's got some one relation. Um, so this, this is this um, Noether map, or maybe it's called the Cremona map. I don't know what people call it. Uh, but it's, it's basically a birational involution of order two. So it takes x, y, z to y, z, x, z, x, y. And f has degree two, obviously, but if I apply f to itself, if I apply f twice, then if I just do the computation, I get x squared, y, z, x, y squared, z, x, y, z squared, and I see I have a common factor of x, y, z. And so I actually get the identity map. And so if I look at f to the n, uh, every time I apply f an even number of times, I'm just going to get the identity. And every time I apply it an odd number of times, I'm just going to get f. So it's going to have degree 2 if n is odd, and it's going to have degree 1 if n is even. And so when I take the nth root, I get a uh, dynamical degree is 1. Okay. Um, so in general, the dynamical degree doesn't have to be an integer. And so I'm going to work with A2, which, and that contradicts what I said about pay, taking a projective variety. But uh, like I said, we can just, we can lift this to a, uh, a, a rational self map of P2. So I'm not really losing anything. The only thing that I might be hiding is the degree calculation, but this is just homogenization and you can check what I say is true. Um, so we're going to take this map, uh, FUV is UV comma U. And so this is like a torus, tor, torus, toric map. Um, 
And notice that if we apply f squared of uv, um, so what does f do? It takes, for the first coordinate, just multiplies the two coordinates together to get the new first coordinate, and then takes the first coordinate over to the second coordinate. And so if you do it twice, you get u squared v u v. If you do it three times, you get u cubed v squared u squared v. And in general, uh, if you do it n times, you get these Fibonacci numbers showing up in the degree. And this is really because it's uh, uv, uv going to uv comma u. So that's a u to the one v to the one, oh, uv comma u. So it's really like um, u is going to one one and v is going to one zero. Hopefully I did that right. Um, but anyway, this should be the matrix that generates the Fibonacci numbers when you take powers. So um, f to the n has degree fn plus 2. And we know, of course, that when we take the nth root of that, that, apply, uh, that uh, tends to the golden ratio, uh, 1 plus root 5 over 2. So the dynamical degree of f is now this irrational number, but still algebraic. Uh, let me look at another example just to, this example is kind of similar to the other example, but it just shows what the dynamical degree tells us about the two dynamical systems. So if I take another one, which is fuv equals uvv, well, this is now uv goes to uv comma v. So now if I were to write down the matrix, I am getting a unipotent matrix. And if I apply f to the n, I can see that I get uv to the nv, and the degree is just n plus 1. And if I take the limit, I just get a 1. And so this has dynamical degree 1. Uh, and having dynamical degree 1 is the smallest dynamical degree you can have. It's very special. And it says in some sense that this dynamical system with this map this tame map corresponding to a unipotent matrix is somehow, the dynamics are somehow tamer than the one coming from this that has eigenvalues uh, row and one over row. If I've, yeah, okay. Okay. So I want to just give a few cases where the dynamical degree has been worked out. So Siboni has um, that if F is algebraically stable, and what that means here is that if you take your uh, f, so I should explain what this notation means, I guess. I've got this ns sub rx. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the neuron severity group, which is the Picard group of x, um, modulo uh, pick zero, the connected component of the identity. And this ends up being a finitely generated abelian group, but it might have some torsion. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tensor it up with R, which kills the torsion and just gives me a finite dimensional real vector space. And my map F, uh, well, if it's algebraically stable, so imagine you have something like an endomorphism, it'll actually induce uh, a self map on this vector space. But in general, there's a class of rational maps called algebraically stable, where, where you get the same sort of thing and where they behave nicely. So that if you take F star to the N, that's the same as f to the n star. And in that case, lambda f is just the spectral radius of this z linear operator f star on this vector space. And in that case, you get that lambda f is an algebraic integer uh, because the spectral radius of an, of an integer matrix. Uh, Diller and Favre uh, showed that by rational maps of P2, you can always achieve algebraic stability. So you can um, show that the dynamical degree of any birational self map of P2 is an algebraic uh, integer. And Favre and Janssen did a similar thing, but their thing is actually very difficult. They looked at dominant endomorph endomorphisms of A2. The dynamical degrees are always algebraic integers. In fact, they can even say more, they're either integers, so things like you know this map that we saw, x y goes to x squared y squared, where the dynamical degree is just two because the iterates are all just powers of two. Um, or there are things like rho; they're they're basically um, you know uh, quadratic um, irrationals. 
and that's all you can get. And it's a very difficult uh, paper. And then I should point out that uh, Bonifant, Bonifant uh, Fornes, and Ulrich uh, showed there are only countably many different dynamical degrees. So it's a countable set. And um, we've seen that under a lot of conditions, we get algebraic numbers. So it's a very natural question to ask, um, is the dynamical degree always an algebraic integer or, or at least an algebraic number? And the purpose of the talk, well, the title gives it away, but uh, the answer is no. And this is work with um, Jeff Diller and Matthias Jonsson. And at the end of the talk, I'll say we're doing some work, uh, us three, along with um, Holly Krieger. Um, so I'll talk about that hopefully at the end. But our main theorem is that there exists a dominant rational map f from p2 to p2, uh, whose dynamical degree is a transcendental number. And I should just make a remark that if you look here, we have this diller favre result that says by rational maps of p2, um, the dynamical degrees are algebraic integers. So our map is clearly not going to be a birational self map. It's, uh, it's not birational. Um, did I want to say anything else about this? I should point out that I was uh, fortunate enough to go to a, a Simon's uh, workshop uh, sometime last year, and that's where I met Jeff. I already knew Matthias, and um, we just happened to—they—they they, they just happened to talk to me about this, and, and that's how the collaboration started. But they had been working on this before, so I was sort of in the right place in the right time, in some sense. So I'll try to give an overview of. Um, how this works and say what the construction is. So the construction uh, is they're all maps of the form where we take a tau composed with a, with a sigma, where this sigma is a fixed uh, birational involution of P2. And I've, it's easier for me just to, uh, to use an affine piece rather than, than P2, so if that's okay. And then we have this, um, this map which is really an endomorphism of uh, uh, GM squared, which is tau of y1, y2 is this map. And this is where you can see where we're not birational. It's clearly not birational. So this is a monomial map. And the only property we need for the transcendence argument to go through is that a plus bi to the n should never be real. Okay, so uh, basically saying that when we write this in polar form, Uh, maybe I should, what do I want to say? I want to say theta is not a rational multiple of pi, I guess. I want to say something like that. Oops, what's going on? Okay, so if we have these properties, then every map of this form is going to have a transcendental dynamical degree. Okay. So um, Favre, uh, in 2003, he showed that under these conditions, the map tau that we give this monomial map can't be conjugated to an algebraically stable map. Although still we do have that, uh, sorry, this should be, uh, so lambda of tau is still an algebraic integer though. And lambda of sigma is equal to one. It's sort of like that um, Nutter map I gave earlier on. Um, so the key fact, and this is really all Matthias and Jeff, I, or Jeff and Matthias, I guess, depending on the order, is that the degrees of these f to the n's are really closely related to the tau to the n's. And this is really the key fact that if we look at the, de the degree sequence of tau to the j, this, this nice map, and we call it dj, then our dynamical degree is the unique positive solution on zero infinity that satisfies this equation. Okay, so the question then becomes, we've got this power series and we just say, okay, we want to prove that the value we plug in that gives us one has to be transcendental. It becomes that question. So it becomes a completely, uh, a completely nice problem in Diophantine approximation. And there are other problems of this type that hopefully I'll get to talk about. So this part of the is difficult and I can say it's difficult because it is all Jeff and Matthias. And it really relies on a careful analysis of how these sigma and taus act on the space evaluations of, uh, a poly of the function field in two variables. Um, and 
again, it's a very, it's very delicate because it relies carefully on how this birational map sigma is chosen so that it behaves well with the tau. But what they sh are able to show recursively is that if you let d of n, d sub n be the degree of tau to the n and e of n be the degree of f n, f to the n, which is the thing we're after, then we have this nice um, relationship that en is equal to this expression where we have to set d0 equal to one and e0 equal to two. And what that means is that if we recast this in terms of generating functions, then what we can say is that we've got this, uh, this relationship, e of z is one minus d of z equals two. And that's why we picked our, our starting values as we did. So now what we get is that the dynamical degree of f, well, we know it's just uh, one over the radius of convergence of uh, e of z, because these are the, right? The dynamical degree is just this limit. By definition, en is the degree of f to the n. So the dynamical degree of f is just going to be one over the radius of convergence of this. And similarly, the dynamical degree of tau is one over the radius of convergence of d. Um, so one thing that's well known is that if you take a map, if you take a generating series like this associated to a map and you approach it, as you approach the radius of convergence from the left, it has to go to infinity. And that's just an, an easy exercise using submultiplicativity. So what that means is because we go off to infinity, there's going to be some point in the interval from zero to, to the radius of convergence where d of z zero is equal to one. And then that means that this has a pole there or, or a singularity there. And that has to be the radius of convergence because um, two over one minus dz is analytic in, inside that region. So um, that tells us that the dynamical degree, which we said was um, one over the radius of convergence satisfies this. It's the expression, it's where this d of z is one. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. Um, but now uh, we can forget all the, um, all the complex dynamics and we have a purely uh, Diophantine question of proving that a lambda that is the solution to this equation is transcendental. So it's uh, Sorry, a totally different world now we leave. I had a, a quick question. Yes. So in the previous slide, uh, what happened with the sigma? Uh, in the previous slide, uh, what happened with sigma? Ah. The F was, was it F tau sigma or sigma tau? F was, um, it, it might be actually be easier to say that F is tau yeah. sigma. Got it. Um, yeah, so the sigma, I mean, it, it comes into play with this computation, but. Um, I see, so the, so the sigma comes into play when you're proving that recursive relation between the ENs and the DNs? Yes. Got it, yeah. thank you. So now the question is, how do we show that this solution is transcendental? Uh, I, okay, so let's do this in terms of Diophantine approximation. And let's look at something that, um, well, people who, who do Diophantine approximation know this much better than I do. But there's a general philosophy that if you have a power series that's not algebraic, and let's say it has some additional structure that allows us to um, produce rational approximations to it, uh, good rational approximations, then what one expects is that when you specialize at q bar points inside the radius of convergence, you should get something that's transcendental unless there's a compelling uh, reason why, why not. And well, that seems like it's saying either it's transcendental or it's not, which I am, but I'm saying there's some, there's some explanation for what's going on for, for when transcendence doesn't hold. And let me give some examples. So the first is a siegel shidlovsky uh, theorem, and I'll mention the result of Boyker's, Boyker's as well. Um, so as an example, if you take the function e to the x, so this is what's called a, an e function and it's obviously transcendental e function. 
And what we know is that when we plug in uh, e to the alpha, the, well, the radius convergence here is everything. So if we plug in any e to the alpha for any uh, algebraic value other than zero, we get a transcendental number. And this is a general phenomenon that if you have an e function, um, you can make some system uh, describing the, the uh, differential equation satisfied by it. And you can just, you just want to throw out poles and zeros of uh, rational functions in the system and throw out zero as well. And those are bad values. And it says, if you take any other algebraic value and you evaluate there, you should get it, one always has, uh, you should get a transcendental value specialization. And then um, with difference equations, you can look at say Mahler's method and I'll point out work of Philippon and Adam Chevsky and uh, Colin Fabergeon that says if you take an, an irrational Mahler series over a number field, uh, then when you specialize, uh, you get a transcendental number, except outside of a computable set of bad values. And bad values, again, come from a system, from, you know, it pulls inside of a, a system for this uh, series. Okay, so uh, let me see where I am. Okay, I better hurry up a bit. So now we see a general approach to how we show that lambda f is transcendental. We're going to use the structure of D to show that D of alpha is transcendental for algebraic alpha inside the radius convergence outside of bad values. And then we're going to show somehow that one over lambda can't be bad. But now we know that D of alpha equals one, so that means alpha can't be algebraic because it can't, it's not bad. So if it were algebraic, then D of alpha would have to be transcendental. So that's our, that's the strategy. Just a, sorry, sorry? Jason, just a question from, uh, just a question from uh, uh, an asking for a clarification, just what is an original Mahler series? Ah, okay. So when I just say, all I mean is that F of Z is a power series. And I just mean that it's not a rational power series. So it's not, uh, given uh -huh. by the expansion of a rational function at z equals zero. And in fact, if it's irrational, it's, it's, uh, I think it's due to Bezevan that it has to be transcendental. Uh, so hopefully that's okay. So that's all I mean by irrational. I mean, it's confusing. I mean, not a rational power series. So it's, it's, it's coefficients don't satisfy a linear recurrence. Where was I? Um, here. So I wanted to say how we do this in practice. So the idea is you take your series, D of Z, and you show you have good uh, approximations by rational functions uh, in the sense that if phi n has degree a n, then I want, uh, I want the difference to be big O of Z to the a times a n, where a is some big number bigger than two. Um, and this will actually imply that my D of Z is transcendental unless it just by some fluke happens to be equal to all my phi n's for n large. Um, and then one wants to argue that phi n alpha is a good approximation of D alpha, which sort of makes sense if you look at this. And then um, you want to just use the, you know, the typical methods in, in, in transcendence theory to show that D of alpha has to be transcendental unless there was some compelling reason it's not, which in this case would be that the phi n of alphas happen to agree with D of alpha. So that's our compelling reason why it might not be transcendental. Okay. So um, we want to apply this strategy. So we need a closed form for our series D of Z. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to let dj be the degree of tau to the j. So remember, this was what our, our, our series was. And this is now, and the other thing I mentioned were before, where, where it was this, uh, you know, this recursive for expression involving the ENs and DNs, that was very difficult. But this is more of an elementary computation. This is some, so somehow corresponding to the matrix A, B, minus B, A, and taking powers of it and just doing a degree computation. And so what you can show is that the degree of tau to the j is given by this expression. So here zeta is a plus bi, and gamma j is one of these elements 
and you choose whichever one maximizes this right hand side. And maybe it's easier if I draw a picture, to, it's probably easier if I draw a picture. We're going to let zeta, um, we've got this a plus ib, and what we do is we compute a to the, a, we compute zeta to the n, and we're going to end up in one of these regions. And if we end up here, then we're just going to take c minus 2d. And that's going to be positive because the imaginary part is negative. So depending on what region we end up on, and when we apply zeta to the n, wherever zeta to the n ends up, that's the expression we use to compute d of n. We take the real part of zeta to the n plus 2 times the imaginary part if, if we're in this region. Okay, so, um, and now what we're going to basically use is the fact that our, our the argument of our zeta is irrational. So, you know, we're going to, there's not going to be any real periodicity in, in terms of which region we lie in. So that's the idea. So we're interested in the case when the angle theta is irrational. That was the hypothesis before. So we're going to make that assumption from now on. And Hasselhoff and Prop, uh, Hasselblatt and Prop showed, sorry, showed that the sequence DJ does not satisfy a, a linear occurrence. Uh, and so in particular, it's an irrational power series. It's not rational. And in fact, our argument somehow actually shows it's not even algebraic, although there should be a direct argument for showing it's not algebraic. Typically, to show something's not an algebraic series, you either show it doesn't satisfy a homogeneous linear differential equation, or um, you show by reduction mod p that it's not algebraic, or you use asymptotic methods. Or there's, uh, there's, but anyway, we didn't try this out, but it's, it would be an interesting question to show this is not algebraic. Um, so we're going to use the fact that theta has reasonably good rational approximations. And I, when I say reasonably good, I, mean, I don't mean anything really, just that it's an irrational number and irrational numbers you know, have a continued fraction uh, expansion and that you, these give good approximates to rational approximates to theta. And so we're then going to go, do uh, obtain transcendence using p-adic subspace theorem. And I should point out that it was really Corvaya and Zanier who used uh, p-adic subspace theorem in this way first for proving transcendence. As, as far as I know, they were the first ones to do it, um, to prove transcendence of constants this way. And then Adam Chesky and Bougeau um, showed automatic real numbers were either rational or transcendental using this uh, corvaya zanye uh, modification of their technique. So we're going to use this. We're going to need a lot more linear forms because we don't really have a, an understanding of the angle theta. But I'll hopefully get, be able to explain how this works. So I'll talk about, really, there's a few parts. So I'll talk first about the easiest part, um, which is to construct the rational approximations. And this is sort of intuitively clear. Um, the idea is that if we take the, a good rational approximation to theta, then m over n, then zeta to the n is really close to being a positive real number. It's either here, a little above, or a little below. And if we go back to our picture, that means that if we look at where zeta to the j lies, it's going to lie in one of this quadrants, then zeta to the j plus n is probably also going to lie in the same region because zeta to the n just is very close to a real number. So it's, it's, only, it's not going to change the argument very much. Now, what could happen is we could have some bad luck where zeta to the j is very close to the boundary. And when we multiply it by zeta to the n, it pushes us to the other side. So, but what we can say is that we expect zeta uh, gamma of j plus n to be gamma of j. So we expect to be in the same region unless zeta to the j is very close to one of these boundaries. So what's that saying is saying that gamma j is going to be nearly n periodic. So we expect d of z to be approximated by this function. Well, this would be a good approximation if the gamma j's were actually n periodic, but they're not. So we need some correction. And what we can show is that the number of bad indices up to a constant cn is uniformly bounded. So we don't need that many corrections. 
And also we can show that the bad indices repel in some sense. And that will ultimately be important. So what we're going to do is we're going to adjust dn of z, this approximation we produced, by just adding on k other, at most k other terms that correct for those bad indices. And then we get a new function that we're going to call phi n of z, and that's going to be our good approximation. Okay, so where am I? So showing that uh, this phi n alpha is a good approximation. So I'm gonna, maybe I'll regret doing this, but I thought I should do it just in case people, uh, I know this is a broad number theory seminar, so maybe people don't know the p-adic subspace theorem. But let me just give an idea, an overview. Um, so we're gonna have k as a number field of degree d, and I, I decided to go all in and say we're going to let m of k denote the set of places of k. So really what I mean is that um, each place, we have two types of places, finite places and infinite places, and I'll say what these are. But these basically give us an absolute value, really up to some equivalence, and we're going to pick, a, a, a pick one for each v in a, in a sort of canonical way. Um, I should say that if you haven't seen this, you probably have seen it, at least in the case when k is q, and then you know that the absolute values are precisely the, the p-adic absolute values, where p is a prime, and then the ordinary Euclidean absolute value. And those are my places of q. But in general, I have uh, other places. So let me just explain how this works. I'll try to go over this quickly. We have finite places. So here, um, we're going to use the notation m sub fin of k to be the set of finite places. And what we do is we take the ring of integers and we take a prime ideal p in that ring of integers. So it's a maximal ideal. And so if we take um, the quotient OK mod p, we get a finite field of cardinality n p. And what I have is I have a rank one discrete valuation on this um, OK uh, coming by looking at what power of p. I lie in, right? The biggest power of p I, I lie in. So I get an order. So if x is in p to the m, but not in p to the m plus 1, I can say that its order is m. And I can then put a, a, my, an order on all non-zero elements of my field by just saying, OK, if it's a fraction a over b, then I can say, what's the biggest power of p that uh, the biggest power of the prime ideal p in which a lies? minus the biggest power of prime p that b lies. And I can now define my valuation this way. And this is exactly like the p-adic valuation, where it was p to the minus, right? It's the exact same thing. Um, I don't even know if this is actually all that important, but I, I thought I should say it just because I'm going to say, sit, have a theorem that has all this notation in there. So I might as well uh, state it. We have the infinite places, which people probably know a bit better. We only have finitely many infinite places that correspond to our embeddings into C. And basically, we have two types of embeddings. We have real embeddings and complex embeddings. And if we have a, a, a real embedding, we're just going to take our, our place just defined like this. And then to a pair of complex embeddings, we're going to define our place like this. And the way the like I said, a place is really an equivalence class, but the, the, the nice thing about doing it in this way is that we have this nice product formula. That if you take the product over all places of a non-zero number, you get one. And I should also add that um, this makes sense because the, the absolute value of C is one for all but finitely many places. So this is actually collapses to a finite product. Okay. Um, so now, throughout now, we're going to be working with a finite set of places, and we're always going to assume that it can, includes all infinite places. And if we do that, we can make a ring O sub k of s, um, which is the ring of s integers. So it's just the set of elements where the absolute value uh, is less than or equal to 1 for every place not in s. And notice that if we just take the infinite places, then we just recover OK. So this is some generalization of this. So for instance, if I took 
for Q, if I took the two attic place and the Euclidean place, then the ring of integers uh, here would be the two attic rationals, right? Because uh, one half has absolute value one for all places other than two. And the last bit of notation we want is we want to have some notion of height of an M tuple. And this is what our height sub S is. So we just take the max over the, the X i's at each of my places and take the product. Okay, so if you've seen heights before, that sort of makes sense. Okay, so that was a lot of stuff uh, just for one thing, which I didn't say. So instead of using a p-adic subspace theorem, we're going to use a theorem of Averza, which is more or less uh, a, a, a version of p-adic subspace, but it's, it works better for us. And here's the theorem. So we've got a finite set of places, and it has to contain all the infinite places. So that's exactly like p-adic subspace theorem. And we've got an integer m bigger than or equal to 2, and a positive constant epsilon that can be whatever we want. And there's a constant c. It's not really it's not an effective constant if you're wondering but it's um well it's something it's a constant um such that if you take some your vector x1 through xm uh in the ring of uh, s integers and we suppose that every um subsum is non-zero every non-trivial subsum is non-zero then we've got this inequality which might be a little hard to look at but how you can think of it is saying that the sum of the xi's in some sense can't be too small, right? So maybe the easiest case to look at would be is if you look at things like s units, um, so things that are units in this ring, and then in that case, um, these, these products all just become one. And it's basically saying that a, a non-vanishing sum of s units uh, can't be too small compared to the biggest element in that non-vanishing sum. And in fact, you can make it, uh, in, in fact, you can take any power of epsilon and it just relates to the height of the epsilon. So it can't be too small. So that's the theorem. But notice it's more general than beyond S units. So that's the power of it. And why this theorem is useful to us rather than subspace theorem is because we have these correction factors, which when we specialize will actually end up being S units. So they behave well with respect to Everts' theorem, but not everything is an S unit. So um, we need to uh, work with that. So I see I've got about six minutes left. So let me try to wrap this up in almost six minutes. So how do we use Everts' theorem? So you might remember we made this approximation phi n of z, which looked like this. Uh, truncated series, but we had to add on some bounded, uniformly bounded number of monomials, which depend on n, which took account for those bad J approximations, the, that where the periodicity failed. And so really our approximation looks like this. And the significance of this, this has no real piatic significance to us, but if we take an infinite place, it does have some significance because it's saying that at an infinite place, uh, when we plug in, we should get something, something small if we plug in inside the radius of convergence. So at infinite places, this, this expression is quite strong. So now remember, um, our goal is to show that if alpha is algebraic and inside the radius convergence, then d of alpha is transcendental unless there's some reason otherwise, which is that the phi NF alpha that is an exact approximation. So we're going to use the Corvaya-Zanye original strategy, which is really great. The original strategy was you, you want to say, okay, suppose this is algebraic. Okay, so now we can make, consider um, the Galois closure of the field where we throw in beta and alpha and some other constants. And we're going to use some sort of um, piatic subspace variant. Um, and then we're going to show that this can't happen, that, we, that we're going to get a contradiction. 
So let's return to our, uh, our expression, and maybe I'll have to go over this a little fast. Um, but we're going to take S to be the set of all places where we're going to take all the infinite places of this field K that we formed, along with the places at which the non-zero elements from our element beta, alpha, these gamma j's, these ci's, which are all in a finite uh, set that doesn't depend on n, uh, where these where the places where the, the absolute values are not one, uh, which I guess I said the places at which, yeah. Um, then like we said, if we specialize, we get this, and this approximation is really only useful at the infinite places. So now what we're going to do is we're going to use technical estimates where we apply the Averza theorem uh, to show that d of alpha is algebraic, then it has to be equal to phi n of alpha. Well, what's the idea? Um, we've got an infinite place where this is very small. And if we expand this out, and we expand these out, um, these, when we expand these out, these are just now S units, according to our construction of S. And then we've got this awkward thing, which is just a, an S integer. But what we can do is we can apply uh, a Verzis theorem, and we show that no subsum can vanish and so we get that something has to be kind of big at a fixed place, a fixed infinite place. But um, we know at a fixed infinite place, we can make this smaller than that, and we get a contradiction that way. I, I went over this a little fast, but I don't even think if I went over it slowly, it would make uh, more sense, but that's just the intuitive idea. It's, you know, these transcendence proofs are, you sort of have to sit down and do them yourself sometimes. Um, so now finally, the last part is we use an ad hoc argument to show that if alpha is positive and real and inside the radius of convergence, then you always get this inequality. It doesn't matter if alpha is transcendental, algebraic, whatever. So that means that these phi and alpha, these approximations can't be exact. And so what we get is then that alpha, which is one over the dynamical degree, can't be algebraic because when we specialize, we don't get a transcendental value. Okay? So that's how the proof works. I don't know if I uh, made it so much sense, but let me just say a few things, because uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, there's joint work with Matthias and Jeff, but also with Holly Krieger. So um, one question one can ask is, our maps are not birational self maps, right? We said that the Diller-Favre uh, result shows that birational self-maps of P2 have algebraic dynamical degree. So you can ask what happens for birational maps maybe of higher uh, dimensional projective varieties. And there's also a kind of an interesting question of, you can look at the field generated by all dynamical degrees. And now once we know it's not algebraic, well, we should expect that maybe it has infinite transcendence degree. Um, and uh, I'll say a little bit about these things. So this is work in progress um, with the three authors, but also with Holly Krieger. Um, so like we said, the, we, we sort of did this uh, in a very uh, special setting where we had this very special map D of Z, but it obviously applies more broadly. And so we want to give a, there should be a sort of general uh, transcendence criterion that applies to lots of maps coming from dynamics. And so with this, we think, um, I don't want to claim anything because it's not uh, been nailed down, but we think we should be able to find birational self maps of P3 that have transcendental dynamical degrees. So that leads to the other question. And this will also just maybe of interest for its own sake, it, will, it gives rise to a sort of general transcendence problem, um, which I decided not to write down because it's a little tricky, but it's basically, a transcendence problem um, where you look at special values of series that are defined on these piecewise uh, uh, constant functions in this way and with matrices with certain eigenvalues um, and you ask whether you get a transcendental number number when you when you look at the value that gives you a, a one or something like that um, the difficulty now lies in the fact that maybe 
you don't have a dominant eigenvalue or, or, or something like this, or, or you, know, you have multiple dominant eigenvalues, I guess I should say. Um, now, the infinite transcendence degree question, I think, is an interesting one. The answer is probably yes, and probably the collection of maps that we produce, we produce an infinite family of them. Probably you could prove infinite transcendence degree of these maps if you really sat down and were motivated to do so. But uh, it's more involved, and I don't know if it's uh, something I, I plan to revisit anytime soon. So I think my time is up, so I'll say thanks, and I will end the talk uh, now. So thank you. <laughs>